The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts, this is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And this show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Sean Heron. And as always, I get the privilege of introducing our guests. We've got a a veteran to the show and a veteran in real life. He's an author, Second Amendment advocate, professional rabble rouser, and host of the Matter of Facts podcast, Bill Rabelais. How's it going, man? Thanks for having me back on, Sean. Good to see you again. Glad to have you. And next up, we've got kind of a newbie. I mean, her husband, Glenn Tate, was on at one point, but she's the author of a series, A Great State. Glenn Tate's wife, prepper and lover of the Constitution and Second Amendment, Shelby Gallagher, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Glad to have you. And uh, before we get started, I just want to remind people, go check out the Patriot Patch Company. That's patriotpatch.co. They have a pretty awesome Patch of the Month Club, and I think you would like that very much. Let's go ahead and get right into the stories. First up is from the NRA ILA. Pittsburgh residents file a challenge to the city's 10-round magazine law. Uh, This comes to us after they put in... They put in place that ridiculous thing where it's like, oh, anything more than 10 rounds is high capacity, even though they're standard capacity, as we all know. But yep, from the NRA ILA, it says Pittsburgh residents have a right to carry the self-defense tool that best suits their needs. And the NRA is proud to support this challenge to the city's magazine ban, says Chris Cox. And restricting law-abiding citizens from exercising their constitutional rights will do nothing to stop violent criminals. Uh, I agree with all of this. I'm glad to see this being litigated. And uh, Shelby, what are your thoughts? I'm I'm all for it. And I think we're seeing other versions of this around the country with, with similar communities um, pushing back on similar laws. So I'm all for it too. The more we can make the um, those anti-gunners have to act defensively for their stupid ideas, I'm all for it. 100%. The attorney, David Thompson, he's an attorney for the plaintiffs. Uh, So the Pennsylvania law is very clear that the power to regulate firearms is the exclusive province of the General Assembly, not local governments. Pennsylvania courts have repeatedly struck down Pittsburgh ordinances that attempted to regulate firearms in defiance of state law. And we are confident that this latest ordinance will meet the same fate. Bill? I'm 100% for it. I mean, I'm I'm glad to see something kind of proactive happening in the Second Amendment space. The only thing that ever really frustrates me about a moment like this is that I know lawyers don't work for free. I wish they did. And it it always strikes me as very counterproductive when we, the citizenry, we, the people, have to expend our time, our money, and our effort to reclaim the rights that were taken from us by the stroke of a pen. And there's no, there's no, there seems to be no penalty for our elected officials, unless they get voted out of office. That's about the worst thing that ever happens to them. What I would personally love to see is for a couple of local politicians to actually get personally sued for having written these laws in the first place. Put teeth back into the Second Amendment to say, if you vi- if you pass laws that violate the Second Amendment, you are personally liable. That might, that might be what it ends up making these kinds of things not happen anymore. If a person has to think to himself, not only am I going to get voted out of office, I'm going to get sued. But this is a step in the right direction. I hope, I hope someplace there's a frigging anti-gunner screeching maniacally reading this. Yeah, I agree. I do too. I think that would actually be pretty great. It, you know, on first thought, I'm like, you know what? That's, that's actually awesome. I totally agree. I can't think of any reason why I wouldn't want that. About any law, really. Mm-hmm. Texas pushes anti-censorship bills. So this is not something that we would normally cover here, but. I thought it was interesting enough, especially since, you know, that everyone's so embedded in social media and especially if people in the gun world were hugely restricted. So the committee on state affairs in the Texas Senate approved a proposal Monday that would protect Texans from censorship by social media platforms. The bill will now be considered by the Senate at large. This bill was introduced by state Senator Brian Hughes uh, out of Mineola in response to accusations that companies such as Facebook and Twitter are censoring religious and political speech typically made by conservatives, conservatives on their platform. Under the bill, the Office of the Texas Attorney General could file consumer protection lawsuits against platforms if they restrict users based on their viewpoints. Bill, 
I sometimes you surprise me. I think this might be one of those times. I'm I'm, I, I'm loving this. I think if the, if any if there's it's going to pass anywhere, it'll be in Texas, and I think it is a great way for, because we've all felt it. We all we've all we we all three of us here talking have to use social media to push out that our ideas and the, and our products. And when they censor us or when they suppress us, it's costly. And yet you sit here and watch some of the most violent, vile, if you're okay, if we're going to be, you know, standards policy and standards and all that, and you watch the left just say the most vile, hateful, violent things, and they're not getting called out or suppressed in any way. It's there's that whole sense of unfairness. And I love this idea and I hope it gets legs and I hope it gets some traction. And if any place can do it, Texas can. Bill. First of all, <clears throat> I'm actually not 110% certain this will go down in Texas only mm -hmm. for the reason that Texas is my home state. I, I'm, I've lived in Louisiana most of my, most of it since I was a teenager, but I was born in Texas and Texas is actually in certain areas a very, very purple, if not even blue state. I mean, like places like Dallas, Austin, Houston are becoming more liberal by the day and have been that way for a long time. So I think there's going to be substantial pushback against this in those areas. But my bigger concern is that I, I'm actually very conflicted about this because on the one hand, I would love to see social media platforms play straight with us not just us conservatives, us libertarians, us pro-gun people, but just us, the users, the content creators. Yeah. I want to see that happen, but I always get like a knot in my stomach at the idea of allowing or inserting government into anything that pertains to private property rights. It just, it's like, it's like, it's not that I don't see the potential benefit, but I see abuse right behind it. And that's what makes me nervous. It's not that I, I don't see good intent. I do. I, I agree that something needs to happen to hold these social media giants accountable to at least enforce their their you know their 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 rules fairly across the board and to make them transparent. But the minute you insert government into that process, I just I get really antsy. So I'm going to jump in here and I'm going to I'm going to assure you of a couple of things on this one. That's why I'm really interested in this. The first one on this, Phil, is um, that the 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 this is in the Texas legislature. I do not know what the makeup is of the Texas legislature. Yes, you're right. There are definitely liberal areas, Dallas, Houston, um, Austin, definitely liberal areas, but it, it depends on their liberal makeup. If they can get it through the Senate and through the house, I'm sure the governor would sign it to be honest with you. And it sounds like, and I'm trying to pull up the article right now it, my computer is having this moment of, I must redo everything that you've just asked me to do. So it's a little <laughs> bit delayed, but um, it sounds like it's complaint driven. It's not necessarily, Oh, government's overseeing this. It's like, no, it allows users to file lawsuits which I, I actually like that because it's a little bit more balanced that way. So I think it's, it might be that happy medium. Yeah. I don't want government overseeing anything on the internet, honestly, because it's, it's, you know, it's, it does pretty well self-policing as it's, as it is, even it's most flawed ways. But I, I like the idea of it being complaint driven. So when I when I can I get to decide if I'm going to go forward and say, all right, I'm going to file this lawsuit. I love it. I love this idea. Better read yeah. Ch Chavez Torres. He's president of uh, the University of Texas chapter of Young Americans for Liberty. Said, uh, which is a libertarian student organization, said that he feels conflicted about the bill. His quote: Ideally, a private company should be allowed to do whatever they please as long as they're not breaking any laws or infringing on anyone's property. Uh, however, he said that companies such as Facebook and Twitter have too much power to regulate themselves and have cornered the market, the regulators, and our rights. He says, this bill is a catch-22. The state of Texas shouldn't have any say in what these companies do. However, it only seems fair to level this gamed system. Yeah, and, and that that's a lot where that's a lot where my emotions are. It's like, on the one, it, I, I'm very conflicted about it. I don't, I don't want to pick a, a dog in this fight. I, I think the thing that really stood out to me, though, when I read the story, and it's actually the thing I've suggested in the past, I really think the way to beat these social media giants at their own game is to file a class action lawsuit against several of the big ones on behalf of all content creators under a sort of breach of contract type of idea. Because, I mean, if you think about it, you put you create media media. It's hosted on YouTube. It's hosted on Facebook. And 
there's got to be some kind of a contract between you and the platform that uses your content to attract people to it so they can put ads in front of them and they make money off your content indirectly. Yeah. So if they are in some way harming your livelihood or censoring your content without a clear link to some policy you've broken, I see that as a breach of contract because you were told, put your content up as long as it doesn't violate these rules and you're golden. And then when they come back behind that and they change the rules mid game, to me, that just sounds like a breach contract. And I think that's the way to ultimately get them is okay. to force them in court of law to spell out exactly what their content is, exactly what their regulations are, exactly what the rules are and be held accountable for them. And then when they breach their own rules, they've breached contract and they're open to damn, they're, they're liable for damages. They're liable for lost wages, lost revenue. I think that's the way to beat them is with a class action lawsuit, but I haven't seen anybody really like latch onto that idea and try to try to figure out the legalities of it. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a business guy. That's what I went to school for. So, I mean, I guess that that's the space I operate in. I, I, don't, I, I don't see this. I don't see this as like, I know some people talk about regulating social media, like a public utility. And I don't, that's not the space I work no. in. So I don't know really how that work, how that would work out legally. Yeah. But I think from a breach of contract aspect, I that might be a way to get them. I worry about class action because the people who make out like bandits in class actions is attorneys. So, you know, on the one hand, does it set a precedent and make an example? Yes. On the other hand, you know, what, what's the hope, the hoped outcome, but I, I'm not disagreeing with you. Well, it's definitely something to consider. But the hoped outcome isn't that content creators get their money back. Cause like you said, lawyers are going to take like 75% right off the top of that. Mm -hmm. But the goal is to make it hurt so bad they will rethink their policies. Well, and let me jump in here. I, here's here's the, the what just is just mind numbingly just makes me so mad is it takes a mat to do that kind of a lawsuit. You're looking at a five year run. It's going to take an immense amount of time. It takes an immense amount of um, uplift to get that up and off the ground for that to happen. An immense amount of money. It goes back to almost what our previous article to get some of these, you know, lawsuits with teeth in them going. It takes so much effort. Um, so uh, now, in a perfect world, what would be? Do I do I want government involved in social media? Heck no. But when you have social media acting as irresponsibly as they do with the with people's uh, first and second amendment rights i've got issues with that and there needs to be some sort of uh i, I hate using the word regulation but they, they don't they're obviously not good at self-regulating themselves and they are not and they are beholden to those who um they align with and there needs to be some sort of accountability. I don't know if I want to say the word um, regulation, but they need to be accountable to something. Lawsuits are a great way to do that. They take an immense amount. I also like the idea of, of what what's in this bill is that you can file a, you can file with the local. Um, oh, see, my article isn't open. It's um, you have a legal aspect to do that, which I like. That, well, I, this bill seems to me it's just opening a legal a avenue for users to use because Here's the thing. I hate to say it. I love class action lawsuits, but they take forever and they take so, so much money to pull it off. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Excellent conversation. Let's uh, move on. Son shoots home intruder in the head while his sister's hid in the closet. So uh, guy comes home basically, and there's some people hiding in the bushes outside of his house. Uh, he is the father in this situ situation and scenario. Uh, they force him to unlock the door. They go inside, they pistol whip him a little bit. Uh, there's two girls, 21 years old and 15 years old. They, they hide in a closet and hit a panic alarm. At some point, the mother and the son slash brother come home. He realizes that something's wrong. He grabs his gun and fires at the suspects while they're running away. One of them who was armed was shot in the head. The two others jumped over the hood of the mother's car and take a van basically uh, that, that belongs to the family and uh, you know play stupid games win stupid prizes phil i'll start off with you i realized i was muted i <laughs> think i'd take my son out for a beer after that good uh, job uh, good job kid all of them yeah i would take yeah. him out for all the beers and, yeah and, i mean you know, like yeah this is great 
I, I, I see the only like the only thing that somebody might point out is suspects were running away, got shot. I think if you have a gun, you're well with, you're well within your capabilities. Turn around, take a shot at me while you're running away. So I call you fair target at that point. Yep. Well, and let me add add this. Let me just point out here how effective were panic alarms in this situation? Yeah, there's no Zero. police at all until you know everything was everything was all said and done and over. Yeah, yeah. I there's I I love. I try to read one of these a day, one of these situations where a person defended not just their home in this situation, but small children involved. There was a child in one of the cars. Mm -hmm. um, there were, you know, 15 year olds, there were young children, obvious. And especially when you have this situation that starts off right off the bat with violence, getting, even though he got pistol whipped and he survived and that's fine. The, one of the most painful things I can imagine in my life is being pistol whipped, honestly, because it's going to hurt a lot. Yeah. And uh, so if you're going to start out a, a home invasion with pistol whipping, game on, get the, let's go, you know, just, yeah. So cool for this kid to, to honestly save his family. Cause that could have gone really sideways. Yeah. I 100% agree. And you know, he's got to deal with, with who knows, like, you know, what his physical make or I'm sorry, psychological makeup is. Uh, he has to deal with this. The the guy that he shot in the head did die. Uh, and I hope that he knows, you know, you're defending the people that you love. You're defending those under your umbrella of protection. And the running away thing makes me, it makes me pause for sure. But at the same time, I'm like, you know what? If you can explain why you did it and you had a good reason to do it, uh, I'm down. If you just did it to intimidate or whatever, that that's another thing completely. But, you know, this was a violent encounter. This was a violent home invasion that, that violence was a key factor in. and at that point, yeah, I, I really think that he he did well, and I hope that uh, it ends up like that, and that there's no uh, you know bad outcomes for him. Well, and he, I'm going to jump in and say something. This and I and I would I, something I learned recently. There's this really good television show on called Body Cam. Have either of you watched it? No. I, I'm aware of it, but I haven't watched it. I totally recommend it because of because of this very conversation. What you realize when you watch it's it's basically bo it's body cam footage of police officers when they're in awful situations that happen very quickly, and you know it goes from one moment we're talking to something to the next minute guns guns out you know casings flying. Um, one show in particular, I, I I think of this one a lot where we have a suspect running away. He's running down the back of, of like an apartment complex and he turns around and he just lets loose two shots. Both There's two officers pursuing him and both of them perish. So when someone's running away with a firearm and they, what they even though they're running away, I, I couldn't believe, first of all, two, it was incredibly sad that these two young officers died, that you can turn around. I mean, talk about either awesome luck. Yeah or an awesome shot to turn around as you're running to pull off two shots and kill two people. That's how dangerous that can be. So if somebody's running, I, my thinking completely changed. If you're running away from me, you have a firearm. I know, I know what can happen now. <laughs> and you know, the threat is still there until you are down and that firearm is out of your hands. Every loaded firearm is a dangerous firearm, right? So that, I recommend that show because you can see how quickly these things can change yeah. so fast. Yeah. I, I'm just wondering what the what those cops did to John Wick's dog. Clearly, <laughs> that was, he was running away from them. Uh, that's awful. But yeah, and uh, that actually brings up our next advertiser, second call defense. So this this kid, you know, was shooting at him uh, as they were running away. And if if it makes us question, it definitely makes the the DA in that county probably question as well. And he's going to take a bigger look at it. And you know, second call defense. That's what they cover. Things like this, when when there is a question, when you discharge your firearm in self defense, regardless of what the situation is, they kind of help you from day one, dollar one. You're never out of pocket. They help you with attorneys. They pay for the attorneys. They pay for the trials if they get to that point. They pay for damages, civil and uh, civil damages, and your criminal trial and all that stuff. And uh, you can find out more at firearmsradio.tv/scd. But it's it's stories like this that you know, make me really believe in self-defense insurance and think that it's important for any gun owner uh, at all. Awesome. People who carry. Awesome. All right. Next story comes to us from Oregon. There's a bill that would teach gun safety to first graders. Uh, this has actually been introduced. It's unlikely it's actually going to pass its initial public hearing just because 
of the way that the government is set up there. Some work sessions have expired and there's not much that's going to go on. However, it's interesting. It would offer an annual 30 minute firearm safety and accident prevention class to first grade students. Um, I think that education is hugely important and Shelby, I'll start off with you. Well, this is my former place of residence. I lived in Oregon for an awful long time. Um, I, I, I think it, I, I think it's a common sense bill. I think it'd be great. I think the legis, you know, what's nice is that the a couple of legis, three legislatures, uh, legislators, I should say, introduced it to Republicans and a Democrat. So that's always nice when you get kind of cross, cross the aisle sort of uh, agreement on that. It's very, it's it's a very good of the order sort of a thing. Here's the thing about Oregon: it's got a super majority of Democrats who are um, who's. Uh, campaigns and um, offices are paid for by anti-gun groups. There is, is no way this is going to make it to the governor's desk. And even if unicorns existed and it made it to her desk, there's no way she's going to pass it. So, I mean, it's, it's hopeful and wonderful. Um, but, and it's, would it be awesome? Yes. It will never happen. Sadly. I, I do agree. Uh, even the guy introducing the bill knows it. One of the very final sentences is that um, he doesn't expect that it'll actually go, but he says that they'll bring it back. And he said, if we can make this work in Oregon, we can make this work anywhere. Now, some of the pushback, Phil, before I go to you is that, you know, there's a lot of people actually in favor of the bill, which is kind of surprising, but the League of Women Voters are among critics who argue the bill won't accomplish its intended goals. And they feel that the onus should be on adult gun owners to store weapons responsibly and away from children. So I think that they kind of live under this a misconception that no matter how hard you lock up, that kids aren't curious and kids won't get into it. But Phil, I know you're a father. I know that you're very interested in, you know, safety and thing and education as well. But what are your thoughts on this whole thing? Well, first, I just want to point out this one line from the from this article that just jumps right out at me. The league strongly supports evidence based solutions, holding adults accountable for the health of our children and the wise use of education dollars. We urge a no vote on SB 801. You know, I use this analogy right before we start rolling the show, and it's a little bit perverse, but bear with me. I don't have a kilo of cocaine lying around in my house. It, you know, not cool to have in my home. It's dangerous. It's horrible. It's illegal. But I'm still going to have the conversation with my daughter about illegal drugs because it's my responsibility as a father to prepare her for things she may encounter out in the world that could harm her. That's my responsibility as a dad. I agree. It's our responsibility as parents to teach our children about firearm safety, whether or not you have guns in the house, whether or not. I mean, I get it. Yes, adults should be responsible for the safe, for the safe, safely securing their firearms. Roger that, League of Women. But the fact of the matter is, not everybody's going to. That's human nature. I mean, there have been stories, like especially like in inner cities, where somebody will just find a throwaway gun at a kid's playground. Wouldn't you rather your kid know that's a gun that can hurt people? I need to go find an adult, or would you rather pick it up and play with it because they didn't have this class? I started teaching my daughter about gun safety when she was three, not how to shoot, not gun ha handling, not how to unload a gun. The lessons were really simple. This is a gun. I have them in the house, and if you play with them as a child, they can hurt or kill you. And it was a very frank conversation I had because I wanted to press upon my young daughter the incredible severity of what I was communicating with her. And she gets it I, I, that I leave my guns lying around because I have full faith in the, the decision making of a six year old now. But I'd rather teach these children gun safety in first grade or whatever. And the fact of the matter is, in the political environment we have today, not all parents will teach that. I okay. wish they would. But not all of them will. So let's 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 get out of our fields for just a minute and let's admit: a yes, guns are dangerous. They can be if they're mishandled or misused. So let's teach our kids safety. Well, and I and I, I totally agree, absolutely agree. And let me just throw this out there again: former, recent former resident of the state of Oregon, League of Women Voters is talking out both sides of their mouth. Honestly, and, and I have enough frustration with them. Problem is, is that a lot of people take their endorsements very seriously. If you're listening to this, don't listen. Legal Women Voters is a bunch of left, lean, hard left-leaning progressive 
um, political group that gets a lot of money from all the feel good, uh, you know, flower children from the 60s that still live in Portland. So here's the deal, though. There's a lot of bills in Oregon that are for, for if you own a firearm, you have to lock it up. You uh, you can lose your firearms. You can you will pay huge fines. You will blah, blah, blah. I bet you darn sure that they're pro that one, even though they say in this statement, we believe it's up to the adults to decide how to, you know, they're taking a very libertarian, they're trying to anyway, saying a very libertarian liberty sort of, it's up to the responsibility of the adults. Oh yeah, if it is, then why, are, why is this group also in favor of serious sanctions if you don't have gun safes in your house? Yeah. I think they're, they're, they're a bunch of hypocrites. I'm going to say it. No, there you I go. Agree. What if Point of contention. Yeah. The opioid crisis in this country kills many times more people every year than firearms do. Mm -hmm. Many, many times more opio opioid crisis. Yet there's no law that requires you to have a freaking safe to store your freaking prescription medications. But if you don't have a safe to store your guns, you go to jail. Does and anybody else? Does anybody the, else just does that make my beard itch? Is that just me or is anybody <laughs> else kind of like it's true? It makes my work? it's true, it makes my beard itch. I'm gonna admit it right here. <laughs> no, I'm 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 with you hundred percent. It's it's never about it's 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 only about guns and taking guns away and incentivizing um incentivizing badness, honestly. They they want to punish people. Uh, you know, there's there's parents and we read about the stories every single month or every single week, I should say, about parents whose kids hurt themselves with guns. But if you actually look at the numbers in this, it's, it's a very small amount. It's a statistical anomaly, I would even say. But I think that education is hugely important. And uh, yeah, I think we've covered that one. Which, just so that doesn't get taken out of context, that's not to say it's insignificant. Because anytime a child gets hurt, it's a freaking tragedy. Statistically, but, again, yeah, not, statistic not culturally or socially. I understand what you're saying. I'm just looking <laughs> okay for you because somebody will sound by that. But yeah. to add, add to what you said, it is statistically heart-wrenching how many kids are harmed and are killed weekly because of opioids and, and the suicide rates that come with that. That is a tragedy. That is not childhood, an anomaly. Childhood obesity kills more, you know, yeah. is a lot more harmful to children than firearms are. And last I checked, we don't put parents in jail when they feed their kids McDonald's, you know, six meals a day. Just saying, I see. I, I see hypocrisy, and it it annoys me. I agree. Uh, Florida concealed weapons permits approach the two million mark. This is just a celebration. I think. I mean, the, the story is not that surprising to me. Uh, they're expecting to hit two million before summer, uh, as far as concealed carry permits go. I think that's great. Texas comes in at a close second with one point three six million, and uh, yeah, th this is just great news. I think. I think it's. Things have changed in Florida. Florida is not necessarily the gun-friendly haven that it that it always has been, but I think that these numbers and the growth of these numbers actually show that you know people in Florida they're carrying they're carrying firearms, whether it's because Florida is unsafe or because there's you know a good measure of freedom there or has been historically. I don't know, but I, I celebrate these numbers. These are responsible American citizens exercising a right, and they have chosen to get these permits, and I, I think it's good. E either one of you can start us off. Well, I, I'll jump in here, and again, only because I, I'd like to open. I opened this article a few days ago. It won't let me open it now. But let me ask this: Do we know my typical? First of all, yay, go Florida, go go, do it, keep on going, get a few more, buy, do go. Um, is there something going on there? Where, are the, is there <laughs> kind of like what happened recently in California, where you can't, you know, the, the, suddenly we have a magazine ban on ARs? Is there some sort of legislation or? or something that's going to go into effect that's causing a little bit of, uh oh, get our permits now before we can't, you know what I mean? Or, Maybe. okay. Uh, there's definitely some, there's definitely some legislation that's been put in place in Florida ever since Parkland. And uh, I, I think there's a bit of it, but when I looked at a graph of the numbers that I found on another website, it wasn't like there was a huge spike in the amount of concealed carry permits. It was just a steady growth over the years. Nice. So, uh, there's definitely bad legislation going in, but I don't think that it's really driving as much of this as much as just the public perception that Florida is an unsafe place. I mean, Florida man, Florida woman, these these are things that exist, you know, stereotypes exist for a reason. <laughs> Very good. Good. I so, love it. Yep. 
I was about to say good on them, but it's still Florida. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Florida's kind of cray cray. We it's in the it's in the news every single week. There's always every just the most non technical thing. <laughs> There's always the Florida man doing something crazy. So, Phil, what do you think? Uh, Two million, pretty awesome, right? It's a good awesome. start. I, I'd love to see constitutional carry instead of us begging the the nanny state for our to have our rights back. But good, good, let's call it a good baby step. Yeah, I can agree with that. Mm -hmm. out of the what the heck is going on files the aclu sues Lacey school district for suspending students that posted pictures of themselves with guns i almost couldn't even say aclu because i've never said it in a positive way before uh this story comes to us from ammo land so what happened is there was two high school students that posted pictures of they went to the shooting range with their parents and they posted them on snapchat and one of the quotes on snapchat was i know whose house i'm going to when the zombie apocalypse happens or whatever and then the next one was just, you know, a follow on picture to that. Uh, totally innocuous, not threatening, not anything, just people exercising uh, their, their First Amendment right to free speech while they also exercised their Second Amendment rights. Uh, the school found out about it. The, uh, they said that we have a zero tolerance, tolerance weapons policy. They suspended them for five days, which is crazy. So the ACLU has gotten involved. There's laws lawsuits being uh, filed right now. And one of the students said, I'm filing the suit so that no one at my high school in the future has to feel like the First Amendment wasn't meant to include them. Uh, his name is Cody Conroy. I think this is interesting, and I am surprised but happy that the ACLU is getting involved. Uh, Phil, I will start with you. I'm shocked. <laughs> I know. Confused. A little perplexed. Happy. Very shocked. Kind of um, Honestly, the, you know... The, I'm ACLU's past history with first and second amendment issues, notwithstanding, I'm glad to see them get involved in this because I mean, this is, this, this is all, I don't, I hesitate to call it a first minute amendment issue, but this is like a serious breach of protocol and a serious breach of privacy that what these students have done under their parents' supervision away from school in their own time is somehow being used to retroactively, you know, enforce a zero tolerance policy. And I just don't understand where that even comes into play. Like at what point do we, do we as parents have the, you know, find the gumption to tell schools, which I see as agents of the state because they're publicly funded, but we tell them I'm the parent. I get to decide how my child is raised. If I want my child to go to the gun range with me and shoot guns, guess what? Buttercup, they're going to go to the gun range and shoot guns. And the state, the state, the schools, the politicians have no right to be involved in this scenario. Real quick, I'll just read. No. It. They say that they have school. The school has a policy five six one one, which is its weapons, and I'm putting that in air quotes. Policy. School board attorney Chris, I'm not, don't care what the name is, said it was designed to align with the U.S. Secret Service Safe School Initiative, which was put into place after Columbine and the New Jersey Zero Tolerance for Guns Act. Also said that the policy is currently being rewritten for clarity that now will only apply to criminal activity involving a firearm and a legally possessed gun or a firearm taken onto school property or school bus. It would no longer apply to firearms being used legally off school property. It's a great thing, Shelby. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, but it doesn't. I'm, I'm going to control my language just for you, Sean. It doesn't <laughs> daggum well matter. It doesn't happen on school grounds. They don't have the legal foothold to enforce anything I, this I, is no different than the school trying to tell me that their gun free zone extends into my living room yes. oh so that so phil it's i am with you i'm with he's just losing <laughs> his mind over there i love it Sorry, I, I, have, I have i have some experience <laughs> in this because i have teenage kids here's here there's so much overreach here the the aclu good if i can give them an outlier of a at a boy, I will. If <laughs> hey, if they're gonna spend, we just had this discussion. If they're gonna spend their money to sue, all right. On this one, all right. Waste to, you know what I mean? Because they waste their money doing other things that I don't like. Let's do it on this one. Here's the thing that people need to realize: why this is so egregious. First of all, you hit it. You hit a couple of them, Phil. This is on. This is firearms use, legal firearms use, not on school property. For the school to say this, that what they're essentially saying is that we're a policing agent when you are outside of school, off of school property. I call BS on that. No, you're not. I also say, 
and and apparently there are also policing agents for the social media platform that was used apparently and so there's not just second amendment right there's first amendment rights here these are students that are expressing themselves on social media and the courts have been very clear on that in terms of being able on this sort of issue so and not only that when did this you hit it there schools are schools think they are they are not policing agents. If they were bothered by, for some reason, here's the thing. If they were bothered by this, that the student posted this, and they went to the local police and said, you know, we're bothered by this, it, it violates our zero tolerance policy to the local police station, they would, the police officers would go, pound sand, are you kidding? There's no criminal activity here. We're not going to sanction this kid or do anything because we can't. He has the right to go use firearms in a legal manner. You know what I mean? So they chose, the school instead chose to become the policing agent. Oh, if, if I were an attorney, I, I would revel in what it would take yeah. to do this. I'm saying that, again, I'm very schooled, <laughs> I hate to use that word, on these sorts of policies because I, I pay attention to these in my kids' school district. So I'm um, really, ACLU, go get them. Go get them, doggy. Go. <laughs> I'm with you. Uh, I'm just going to run through briefly. I'll, I'll mention these and then you guys can respond to any of them that you choose just because they're kind of smaller stuff, but we've mentioned them on the show previously. So I wanted to give updates. So first off, Nick's check rebound to second highest level in March. So February was really down and uh, March was very, very high. The Missouri lawmaker that proposed mandatory AR-15 ownership was, tr was basically trolling the left. He's like, yeah, I don't even necessarily believe in this. I just wanted them to pick up on it. He's like, he does actually want tax, uh, ref, uh, uh, tax refunds, I guess, based on ownership or tax breaks, I should say. Uh, but it, just in general, uh, proposed mandatory AR-15 ownership, he was kind of against. He's like, yeah, I don't think there should be a mandate of any kind from the government. So good on him, trolling like he knows how. Over 1 million magazines were purchased in California during that Freedom Week where uh, the Judge Benitez basically said that their law out, outlawing standard capacity magazines was unconstitutional. They had a week before he had to put a stay on that order. Uh, for further uh, adjudication. And New Zealand expects large scale civil disobedience with new gun laws. They don't expect, suspect that many people will turn them in. Uh, Shelby, I'll start with you. Any, uh, any of those that really tickled your fancy? I think the one um, New Zealand one, of course, this is in response to the tragic shooting that happened there. Gosh, what has it been three or four weeks ago? Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've seen this. A and we've seen this across our country, so it's kind of nice to see it in another country. Um, you know, we have, I think of Boulder, Colorado, Boulder County, Colorado, that put a ban, that the city council voted in a ban on ARs and asked for people to voluntarily turn in their ARs. And there, what was there, like a handful of people? Well, I'll they tell wanted you, them to register them, actually. That's and, right. You're right. Yeah. You're right. They wanted to, the, I think, and there was a handful of people that did. Has someone who used to live in Boulder County? I can guarantee you there's more than a handful of people that own ARs. Yeah. And so, you know what I mean? It just, it, it, it gives me goosebumps. It gives me hope that when these silly things come in where it's registering or whatever, that people are going to be like, you know, government go pound sand, you know. Um, the one thing that, and it's funny, I was at a conference this last weekend and people were asking about this, the bump stock ban. That I understand turning them in because then you got ATF knocking at your door, making threats. And I don't, oh, fine, take the bump stock. I got other things that can, do, can then accomplish the same thing. So, right. Cause that was a, that, that one had a lot more teeth in it. So it's one of those things, pick your battles folks. I get it. And I don't want to get into a big bump stock argument fan or anything like that. But do you see what I'm saying? It's like, if you just want me to register, I'm not going to do that. If you're going to put me in prison. Okay. I, I'm going to think twice about that one. Yeah. No, I'm with you hundred percent. Bill, what are your thoughts on all those? I'm going to go right back to the same story because I mean, all, all I can say to the uh, to the Kiwis is good on you. Yeah, because yes. this this is this has been my greatest argument every time somebody talks about this new law that's about to be passed or this politicians after guns again. And I always ask them, I'm like, what makes you think they're going to be able to enforce it? Well, they made it illegal. I'm like, uh huh. I heard you. But there's like <laughs> 180 million gun owners in this country, and last I checked. There's not that many federal law enforcement. So at what point do we as gun owners just have to remind ourselves that we have the ability to not comply with a law that we don't believe is appropriate or constitutional? I mean, people speed every day in full, you know, flagrantly. 
right? There's a sign every couple hundred yards that says what the speed limit is. People blow right by at 10, 15 over every day. So I hear people say that, well, it's illegal or it's banned or it's this, that, or the other. And I always point out to them, like, yeah, but people break the law all the time. People jaywalk, people blow the speed limit, people roll stop signs. And yes, those are small laws with reasonably minor penalties. But the point remains that human nature dictates that people will not comply with that which they do not believe they should. But, and and when, it comes to gun, when it comes to gun laws, it's the same thing. Government tells me turn them in or else. Most people are going to say or else. Yeah. And I think it comes down to severity of penalty, right? Because speed, speed limits, like you already mentioned, there's very little penalty there. It's a little bit financial, a little bit of time penalty, and then everyone moves on with their day. We, we all know that speeding tickets and stuff like that generally are just money-making schemes okay. uh, in most places. But with the federal firearms laws, we're talking 10 years, $250,000 as a penalty. That That's a lot more. And Phil, I'm with you, but at the same time, you know, I don't want to be the test case for things like that. Oh, no, I'm not suggesting any one person be the test case. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, to, to quote our own history, the American Revolution, among the things that the crown was trying to ram down our throat was gun control. And the penalty for not complying was basically military tribunal being put up against wall and shot. So I don't know. Like, like I, I don't I don't want to get into a debate You're with too. anybody about what law they should or should not abide by. I would only say that every man and woman has the line that they will not be pushed over. And New Zealand, the state, is about to figure that out the hard way. Yeah. People have a line they will not be pushed over. They will not move. They will not back off. And that that country is about to have to figure this out the hard way, just like Britain did a long time ago. Well, and let me jump in here. One of the pieces that we had also listed here was, um, if, if you look up on our list, Senator calls for compromise and enforced existing gun laws. And, enforce, E-N-F-O-R-C. That's, that's one that I think is a cousin to this. I found this really interesting. Um, Senator Toomey, I got to look this up. Pat Toomey, a um, rep, uh, Republican out of Pennsylvania, has called for, and I think this is genius, called for just sim let's just simply enforce the instead of making more laws let's just enforce the ones we have and he cites i love this and keep in mind he is no friend no. <laughs> of, of second amendment we know that um at all but a quote a great quote from him when a person has been convicted of a crime and is disqualified from purchasing a gun and attempts to do so that person is committing a crime the fbi very seldom prosecutes those cases but the state attorneys general might want to prosecute them so there's that's what and you, all of us here talking we've had this conversation F folks we have plenty of gun laws let's enforce the ones that are on the books the federal ones are a great place to start go you know what i mean so and then let's quit making like here in washington say let's quit making the ones that are unenforceable that absolutely smack in the in the face of the second amendment completely unconstitutional if we just hey when someone goes in and attempts to buy a firearm and they shouldn't call the cops call in the feds man hook them up let's send them off those people should not have a firearm i get that right i that i'm just like that seems so common sense it really does to me oh, yeah. unfortunately, force the law. unfortunately sean knows where i stand on this all gun laws are unconstitutional <laughs> All of them. The only one that's not unconstitutional is the Second Amendment, which says you can have all the guns you please, and the state cannot infringe upon the right to have all the guns you please, of the type you please, yeah, with the magazine pad you please. I agree, and I, I will say, so I was I was looking up a bunch of quotes and reading some Federalist Papers and things like that, and I'll tell you what, anyone who's ever been like, oh, well, you know, the Second Amendment says this, and I'm generally talking about anti-gun people, I'm like, they talk about intent and what they actually intended. And I'm like, man, go, go read some of their quotes and some of the letters that they sent. No, they, they, they intended exactly what the second amendment says. They were the most freedom oriented, take out a corrupt and tyrannical government with everything that we possibly have. There was, there is no question in my mind that when they wrote the second amendment, they knew exactly what they were going for or, or what their intent was. And uh, yeah, I read the militia 1792 and that is a fairly long, lengthy law that was later superseded by later militia acts, one of which established the National Guard. But that militia act was ratified only, I think, four years after the Second Amendment was ratified. So it's fair to assume that 
whatever language was common for the day and whatever opinions were common for the day probably apply to both very equally. Mm -hmm. But while the second act is fairly short, and somehow that makes it much harder to understand, the Militia Act is much longer. And it basically lays out a grocery list of all the stuff as a militiaman you are legally required to have in your home, in your custody at all times. Rifle, ammo, field gear, tent. Basically, it says that you as a as a law-abiding citizen have a responsibility, a legal duty to have a firearm and ammo and all the stuff you need to go to war in your home. Now, that that big old long law is completely incompatible with the idea that civilians shouldn't have to have firearms or that it's it's a it's a, a collective right, not an individual right. Mm -hmm. Like and that's what I was pointing back to. I'm like, you know, the Militia Act of 1792, if that law is taken at face value, the Second Amendment's amazingly clear. Yes. One hundred percent. I mean, you can't you can't say that the Second Amendment only applied to the state when another law four years later said people have to have guns in their homes. <laughs> it's just doesn't yeah. wash. All right, moving on in the show. Sorry about that rabbit hole. That was my fault. But um, I just want to give it was a good one, though. I liked it. I want to give a shout out to uh, a couple men that have passed away recently. Uh, first off, the last of the Doolittle Raiders has died at age 103, and the last of the Tuskegee Airmen has died at age 96. Uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, you should definitely look them up. There's movies and all kinds of other stuff. But uh, Robert McDaniel, he was the last member that was living of those that very elite uh, group of, of black individuals that, that fought for our country. And Dick Cole was the, the last of the Doolittle Raiders. And if you haven't read about the Doolittle Raiders either, you should definitely go do so. They were basically flying a, a suicide mission to show Japan what was up. They didn't have enough fuel to return. They, did, they basically flew in a bunch of bombers. They bombed places in Japan. And then they had to go to China where every single one of them crashed. 77 of 80 originally survived that. Uh, some were further executed by Japan as Japan tried to make a point. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it was a very interesting story. Uh, a lot of them survived some of, uh, I think one plane crashed in Russia, but, you know, very brave. And it did a huge number for morale of our troops from America. And, you know, it had way more impact than just the bombs that were dropped. So I uh, just wanted to give those individuals a shout out. Awesome. Next story. This one's interesting. I know I see this on Facebook a lot, but multiple buyers of Glock auto sears from wish.com arrested by the ATF. Now I know there's a lot of people out there panicking right now because I see posts on, on social media of people buying these things and the ATF has started showing up and actually uh, prosecuting people or arresting people for prosecution, I should say. Um, but yes, wish.com sells some crazy, crazy things, including all these things that are labeled for airsoft or build kits or other things. But yeah, 10 years and $250,000 fine for that stuff. So, uh, you know, if you have ordered them, uh, you should, I, I don't even know what to suggest to you, but the ATF is cracking down. There's multiple cases, uh, several of them showing up on the same day. So they are tracking those 100%. And, you know, just because you can buy something, uh, and I'm with you, Phil, I totally get it, but people need to understand the repercussions of their actions should they choose uh, to ignore laws. But that said, <laughs> I'm with okay. You, man. okay. Just, just <laughs> I'm not, I, I am not publicly advocating for the breach of any law, no matter how stupid I might think they are. But it's it, let's say hypothetically, just for a brief moment, you might decide to break the law. Let's just let's let's go with, let's go down that road. Don't do it on the freaking internet with a credit card that is ostensibly linked to your home address. That makes it very easy for people to come directly to your door because you purchased something illegal over the internet. Yeah. from, from Everybody China. that did this is stupid. And there's so many that have done it. I, I have literally seen, I'd say, at least dozens. And if I've seen dozens, that means that there's hundreds or thousands out there. Uh, yeah. yeah, it is not smart. Don't, don't Again, do Again, I think the law is stupid. Yes. Really stupid. Agreed. Really unconstitutional. Yes. But- the people that did this are really idiots. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, and let me just add this in general. Honestly, if uh, don't break laws, I'm not. Here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. When I get it, Phil, here's what I'm going to ask you. If you break laws and put yourself in prison, okay, go ahead. That means when the collapse happens, we don't, we can't, you, you're, you're, you can't, hey, you can't come and have fun with us as we, you know, fight for freedom. You know what I mean? We need you. We need you to make wise decisions. Here's the thing. Also, too, I encourage people, if you're going to buy firearms parts what, what legally, if you're going to buy firearms parts, 
keep in mind, and you hit on it a little bit, Phil, it is almost like a gun registry. You've just created a digital footprint. So when you go buy a case of ammo, when you go buy an AR lower, when you go buy a Magpul 30 round, you know what I mean? When you buy those things and you do it online, you're creating a footprint. So, and I say that as someone who's about ready to put on her merchandise page on her website, 30 round Magpul, right? So I get that. But I'm just saying, be careful and just think about that when you do it and be wise and be smart and just know we need you for when we need you when the fighting begins. Yes, 100% agree. Uh, that was a public service announcement pretty much. I was just like, oh, this is the thing that's happening. Beware. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> this one, I it is written as a negative. Uh, Michigan police chief pleads guilty to running a celebrity gun ring. And there, there is a police chief in Michigan that basically was allowing people to, uh, you know, pay like a thousand dollars, I believe it was, or something like that, and then making them uh, law enforcement officers, uh, reserve officers is the term that they use. And he was buying guns and tactical gear and ammunition and so on and so forth, and then selling it to those people that he was making his reserve officers. And yes, he was probably doing something bad, but on the same token, I'm like. That is freaking awesome. Uh, I mean, he was doing it for personal enrichment. I get that. At the same time, I'm like, yeah, that's an interesting way around some unjust and unconstitutional gun laws. Shelby, I'll start off with you. Uh, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I get it. I under I get, That's a way to get around those laws. And um, there's other ways to get around those laws. Um, I'm just saying. But when you are in charge, when you're the police chief... I don't like it. I don't like it. You, you do. I mean, seriously, you need to be cool. You need to. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's interesting. I think it's, I think it's creative. It's thinking outside the box. It also smacks me. It's in a different category. What was it in New York, New York city, where basically people were paying off the police chief to get their concealed handgun license. I mean, paying off, like he, he got rich. So yeah. you can, if you start getting into, I'm not saying the Michigan police chief is, but you're starting to get into that realm and that's, yeah, be cool guys out there. Please be cool. Yes. That wasn't one. Yeah. So there you go. You are a hundred percent right. Um, I, I will also say that the town or the village that he was in a uh, village of Oakley has a population of 362 but a roster of 120 reserve officers. Phil? I think the guy's a scumbag because he was honest. He was doing this to try to make a buck, and I find that pretty reprehensible for any public official to misuse their position. However, let's say hypothetically I ever became a, pol a local police chief or sheriff's deputy. Uh, no money involved. I think I would seriously put out the invitation to the entire community and be like, hey, any of y'all want to be a reserve duty sheriff's, sheriff's deputy? I don't want any money. You just got to pass a background check so I know you're not a felon, and I will happily deputize you right here on the spot. Well, then that because uh, then you can carry into gun-free zones. Well, then also too, it it adds to what we were just talking. It you've just created the local militia of the Militia Act, right? I mean, that's actually kind of you kind of want that, but yeah, when you're starting to profit from it, and you know, he has and he doesn't sort of stuff, then it gets a little it gets a little bit corrupty feeling, right? Yeah, and I guess mm. what I don't really understand is why. I mean, Michigan, they, they have pretty good gun laws. They do have handgun registration, which is stupid. But, I mean, like, in general, like, you can get guns and, uh, you know, concealed carry permits in, in Michigan. I don't yeah. really understand why he was doing it. So, clearly, it was for personal enrichment. But uh, I don't understand why anyone wouldn't just go buy a gun. Or maybe it was that he was well, given to prohibited persons or... Because, my, because of the coast of my podcast resides in Michigan... Um, Bear in mind that with a concealed carry permit, there are a number of places you cannot go with a firearm, which annoys me. Yeah. But if you're a law enforcement officer, that doesn't apply. Okay. So what, what that thousand dollars is buying you is the holy mother of all concealed carry permits. Cause you can stick a gun in your waistband and walk anywhere you want into a school, anywhere, pretty much except actually most airports, I think will let you pass TSA. If you, if you're a law enforcement officer, Pretty much the only place you can't carry a gun with if you're if you're a law enforcement officer is like jail and a courthouse. Hmm. Yeah, so that does make a lot of sense. But then again, that's why I've just deputized the entire city. Yeah. <laughs> and be like, be like <laughs> your gun free law, your gun free zones. Those are cute. Watch this. There you yeah. go. 
moving into the I'm offended segment, I, I, there's one story in here that I really wanted to uh, read because I am super offended by it. A Massachusetts police police chief uh, suspended for liking Trump and the NRA. So uh, this guy gets gets the job, says posts somewhere that I'm excited to announce I've accepted the position of chief of police at Mount Holyoke and Smith Colleges, two of the most prestigious all women's institutions in the nation. And then students found his personal Twitter and they became outraged that he was an apparent Trump supporter and a member of the NRA. Uh, One student tweeted, show his dangerous support of Trump as well as anti-immigration and pro-gun sentiments and and declared that he cannot keep this community safe. And he was forced to, he was put on administrative leave and then he was forced to do a just canned apology just of ridiculousness. And oh my God, these snowflakes. Uh, Shelby, I'm gonna start with you. Well, yeah. Uh, um, col- welcome to the you know college and university snowflake growth incubating petri dish of the United States, right? So, um, again, it's it, it's the left being snowflakes. It's the left showing their, and I'm saying this with air quotes and a, a lot of sarcasm. They're being all tolerant, right? There they are being all tolerant, and and that coexisting thing and that that's get along thing is obviously working so well for them. Mm-hmm. It's really sad because you probably, I mean, I, again, I can't open the article because my computer is being um, an idiot, but it's one of those things, probably a very honorable man that has a, probably a very long history in law enforcement, has a history of keeping communities safe. And because a bunch of, you know, 20 year olds, um, do everything, you know, their lives are on Twitter. This poor man is just lost a, re- a good job. And honestly, the play, the, this community is probably a lot less safe. It's really sad. And, and that's what's sad is that what the left, especially those in the snowflake world projects is actually what comes true. They're, they're saying this man can't keep us safe. Well, since you got him ousted, guess what? The bench is probably shallow. We probably don't have anyone else nearby with his credentials to do the same job. Good job on you, snowflakes. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. He, did, he did keep his job, but he had to make some public apologies, uh, such as, and humble himself really, such as Donald Trump's viewpoints do not re- represent our country very well. When Trump did something, I thought he did well. I wanted to like his tweets in hopes to lead to more good behavior. I do not support him. The hate that comes out of the White House is okay. And oh, man. I am so, taking yeah. steps to address my bias. I didn't see it till people pointed it out, to be honest. Blah, 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 blah. Phil? Gosh. <laughs> I think I broke Phil. No, he done. muted it. Out. He's I'm muting all the out. swear words. He's muting all the swear words that are coming out of his mouth. So yeah, it's yeah, I'm, like, I'm emotionally filtering myself. <laughs> all I can say is, first of all, if I were in his position, I think it would have unapologetically like gone on a Trump love Trump love fest just to friggin' melt them down even faster. Because my whole point of view is, don't like me, don't like me. I'm not changing and I'm not recanting anything I've said. I mean, I've I've dealt with my own firestorms on social media, Sean. You know that because when I feel strongly about something, I pretty much just uncork it and let it go. But I'm 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 shocked. Like, I didn't think people were capable of this level of abject, total stupidity. Mm -hmm. They really would rather have a person who doesn't like the president of the United States of America and is not an NRA supporter who, I mean, like, in what world is that more important than whether or not he can effectively manage a police force? Never mind. Massachusetts, carry on. Yeah. Well, and here's the, it's not even that. I'm looking at, and I got it to pull up. The, when the student, this it looks like the students focused on his liking of tweets by the NRA. Students seem outraged that he liked the NRA's tweet about wishing people Merry Christmas. Ignorant students appeared to lecture him instead of asking him real questions. So they came at him. Keep in mind, he liked Trump and he likes the NRA. And this is this is the disconnect that comes back. Quote from the snowflakes. You seem to understand racism as a result of individual bad people. What the heck does that mean? I'm sorry, back to the quote. Racism is systemic. It is perpetuated by individuals. It's not the result of individual bad people. What in the world does that that particular that statement of ridiculousness have to do with Trump or the NRA? This man had to eat crow and say, and and like you just said, prop himself up and force himself to say, I'm taking ex- steps to better myself and understand my bias so he can keep his job. So he had to sit up there and like eat his words and just put on a happy face and all of that because of 
it's it, it, here's the thing, Glenn Tate and I, if, if for those who follow us, you know that we have this whole kind of branding of I miss America. This is one of those moments that those are the words screaming in my head. I miss America when a person could have an opinion. I miss America when someone could like an organization that I may or may not agree with. I miss America when I could love my president. I miss America. <laughs> I miss America when a, a grown man had the testicles to stand up in front of a bunch of snowflakes and say, screw off. I'm not going to recant what I said. I meant it and I mean it more now. That's the only thing that irritates about this whole thing uh, is the only thing that annoys me. It's not even that snowflakes annoy me because I find them actually pretty freaking humorous. What irritates me is when people feel the need to placate these whining children and pat them on the head and apologize for all the microaggressions, the perceived bias, and all this crap. When what we ought to tell them is, are you crying? That's precious. Go stand in the freaking corner and shut up, and the adults are going to handle this. I agree. There you go. Maybe also, a good spot on the play. That'll straighten them out. A whole here's, lot the, faster here's, the thing, here's the thing that, that's happening, though, is that the snowflakes win. In these battles like this, yeah. they they win by just simply bringing, saying the word racism and and floating a couple of, you know, really fuzzy, nice, warm, fuzzy sentences after that. The, the, Trump isn't racist. The NRA isn't racist. They simply said Merry Christmas. Yet we we get out of that. We, that's what I'm saying. Snowflakes win by saying words that shouldn't be assembled together. And unfortunately, yes, I agree with you, Phil. It would be nice if he stood up and just said, go pound sand. This is ridiculous. You children, go put your pacifiers in and come back in five years when you've grown up. I get that. But unfortunately, there's all the the city councils and the support, all of them behind him saying, just go up there, right? And I get that. I get that. It's a political culture. But here's the thing. We need to remember this, folks, if those of you who are listening these 20 year olds are going to be elected officials in a few years. They're going to be the leaders and we are the laugh laughing stock. If you don't believe me, um, Acacio Cortez, there's, yeah. they're coming. Yeah. They're going to be our leaders. We have got to pull these children aside and spank them and put them in a civics class, put the constitution and all the amendments in front of them and tell them, would you learn your country's history before you say stupid things like this. And none of that before you ruin a person's life. I put the blame on these snowflakes and their parents oh, yeah. at the school. Absolutely. Without question. Without question. Just big bullies and, and idiots at the same time. All right. That that's gonna do it. That's our that's our news time for this evening. But before we go, I do want to hear what you guys have been up to and where people can find and keep up with all the stuff that you do out there. Uh Phil, I'm gonna start off with you. Well, like we were talking about before the show, um, I'm still working on the sequel to my first book, American Insurgent. Uh, the, to the sequel will be titled American Insurrection. I've kind of had some issues with my work life and home life lately in the last couple of months, which put me several months behind schedule. Um, the audio book I'm hoping to have released here in the next few weeks, I'm hoping. I got about half of it already narrated. I've been talking to the narrator every couple of days, and he's hard at work pushing it out. And... Um, other than that, I'm not hard to find. I mean, Matter of Facts podcast is on iTunes. You can find us on Spotify, on Stitcher. We're all over Facebook. And I also have an author page, author Phil Rabelais. And if you can't spell that, I don't blame you. It's very Cajun. R-A-B-A-L-A-I-S over on Facebook. So if you're into pro-Second Amendment stuff, libertarian stuff, prepper stuff, come and find us. Me and my co Andrew are very approachable, and we try to put on a good entertaining show. Love it, man. Thanks for being here. Uh, Shelby, tell us, uh, tell us all about yourself, where people can find all the stuff you do. Shelby Gallagher here. Um, I am finishing, uh, I'm, I have finished praise Jesus. <laughs> the third of my trilogy. It is done. Think of me, you know, from Star Wars. It is done. Um, it is um, the third in my trilogy is done. It is in the editor's hands and getting all prettyified. And that should be coming out. Um, I sent an email last week saying, hey, I'm thinking June. And he came back and said, I'm thinking sooner. So I'm hoping it's really soon here. Um, soon after will be the Audible book. Um, and so that's, I'm feeling really good about that. Um, one of the things that has been keeping me busy is along with my husband, Glenn Tate, we just started our own podcast recently that, uh, uh toward the beginning of the year called prepping 2.0. You can find that at prepping 2-0.com. Same thing, same as Phil. 
if you go to the website, you'll see how to connect with us on social media, um, Stitcher, iTunes, all of that. We're all there. And what's really cool, we've been picked up by four radio stations here on the west western side of the United States. So, um, yeah, so we have some listenership there, and we've gotten a whole new fan base from that. Um, if you want to check out his books and my books and and see what we do there, and kind of, and I would encourage you if you want to keep up to us and get our newsletter, which is sent like once every six months, seriously. Sign up for our newsletters on our websites. That's two, that's 299days.com. He's the author of the 10 book series, 299 Days. You can also um, catch me at my website, agreatstate.com, which is the name of my series. Very cool. Thanks so much for being here. It's been, it was absolutely awesome. Thank you. All right. And don't forget, so to find Phil on his podcast, Matter of Facts Podcast, and the book is American Insurgent. And for Shelby, the third one in the series, uh, a great state will be out very soon and prepping 2.0 is that podcast as well. So thanks to you guys for being here. Thanks to everybody for listening. Leave us some reviews if you like the show and uh, you know, don't forget, check out the Patriot patch company and second call defense. And as I always say this week in guns is produced by Kenny Ortega and is a production of the firearms radio network. We'll see you next week.